When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never-ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace, and the norms and notions of what just is isn't always justice. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken but simply unfinished. We, the successors of a country and a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for one. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge our union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions, excuse me, of man. And so we lift our gazes not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first. We must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true, that even as we grieved, we grew. That even as we hurt, we hope that even as we tired, we try, that we'll forever be tied together victorious, not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lighten the blade, but in all the bridges we've made, that is the promise to glade the hill we climb, if only we dare. It's because being American is more than a pride we inherit, it's the past we stepped into and how we repair it. We've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it would destroy our country if it meant delaying democracy. And this effort very nearly succeeded, but while democracy can be periodically delayed, it can never be permanently defeated. In this truth, in this faith, we trust. For while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. This is the era of just redemption we feared at its deception. We did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour, but within it we found the power to author a new chapter, to offer hope and laughter to ourselves. So while we once asked how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe, now we assert. How could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be, a country that is bruised but whole, benevolent but bold, fierce and free. We will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation. Because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. Our blunders become their burdens, but one thing is certain, if we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. So let us leave behind a country better than one we were left with. Every breath from my bronze-pounded chest, we will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise through the gold-limbed hills in the west. We will rise from the windswept northeast where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake-rimmed cities of the Miss West Western states 
We will rise from the sun-baked south. We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover in every nook of our nation, in every corner called our country, our people diverse and beautiful. We emerge battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflamed and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it from there is always light if only we're brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to be it. You all okay? Is, there, is everybody all right? I mean like, have you been injured? How about our children? Are they okay after hearing that? Might they be okay? Just making sure. Because this poem was just banned along with books about black poet Langston Hughes and about black and Cuban history in Miami-Dade County School District for grades K through five. Because one parent who admitted not even reading the entire poem and surely she didn't read the books that she also asked to be banned, petitioned because they included indirect hate messages. She can do this in the state of Florida because their governor signed a bill into law that encouraged and legalized such banning. Yet no ban on assault weapons. In an interview, the woman who admits not being a reader, but a mom involved in her children's education, indicated that she is a Christian. On this Pentecost Sunday, I'm excited. The weather is getting warmer. Hallelujah. Anybody grateful with me in this Midwestern city that is rimmed by lakes? Grateful for a warm weather upon us, finally. We're blessed with a new day with brand new mercies, amen. I see beautiful people, beautiful colors. I'm grateful for our amazing band who shared with us on today and I'm grateful for this church. And it's Pentecost Sunday and I'm also very concerned and just short of disgusted. In the book of Acts, the second chapter, as Georgia read for us, Jesus has ascended and has now sent the promised Holy Spirit, which came as tongues of fire. The reason some of us are wearing red on today and the cross is draped in red with a dove. Thank you, Mary. People began speaking in other languages as we heard this morning, so that a diverse audience could be edified in their own language and all be witnesses to God's power. Peter explained that this amazing event was not because of too much wine, but the fulfillment of prophecy. The prophet Joel who said, in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. I dare to say that Miss Amanda Gorman was prophesying, which means she was speaking truth, speaking what God had inspired through her, and as a Christian, had Miss Gorman's words banned from children in one county. But if we're not careful, the banning of such works, such language, such truth, such history will spread even further if we're not careful and if we remain silent. High Park Union Church, our mission statement is a powerful one. Would you read it with me? It's at the top of the front cover of the bulletin. Let us read it together. To celebrate God's diversity among us through inclusive, open, and affirming Christian fellowship and service. To welcome and honor each person through all stages of life and to pursue God's justice in the world 
with the promise of love, liberation, and joy. Thank you. And here's a few lines from our main call to worship. We did a different one today, but, but you know what we read most Sundays. The lines, if you are gay, straight, bisexual, transgender, non-binary, or done with all labels altogether, you are welcome here. If you are big, small, tall, short, young, old, able, disabled, rich, or poor, you are welcome here. Whatever the color of your skin, your heritage, or cultural background, or immigration status, you are welcome here. Most Sundays we recite this as our call to worship, to exclaim that all people are welcome here. And we still get so many compliments for this call to worship from members and visitors including the suggestion that we not keep it to ourselves for the word needs to hear such welcome. We're doing pretty good, High Park Union Church, in that we've attempted to describe in both mission and welcome the beloved community where all are welcome. What is the beloved community? Dr. King coined this phrase during the Civil Rights Movement to describe God's vision for the world as laid out in scripture where freedoms and equality for all people was achieved. As described by Reverend Michelle Bodle, a minister whose Lenten reflection on the beloved communities defined it so well, in the beloved community, all humanity can share wealth and resources. Not to be confused, she says, with political ideologies. The beloved community as laid out in the sacred text is where hunger and poverty and homelessness are no longer tolerated or considered to be normative. In the beloved community, we have respect for our fellow humans, not simply those who are like us in terms of class or race. Through our mission, High Park Union, and through our welcome, we express our commitment to welcome and serve all people. This High Park Union, we get. Not to say we are perfect, not to say there are those who have entered and have not quite felt that welcome, but we know this is God's call for God's people, that all of God's people are made in God's image and are welcome in God's house. And while I'm proud that we get it and are striving towards it, there is a more inclusive, beloved community towards which we should strive. As that Christian parent in Miami and the Christians on the Miami-Dade school board have proved not all Christians believe as we do. Just as that parent did not read the poem, if I were a betting pastor, I bet that she nor the Christians on the school board have, have read much of the sacred text. Not all Christians read, translate, nor understand the scriptures the same if they read or translate it at all. Therefore, there are divisions among us, those of us who call ourselves Christians. And while some division is understandable based on upbringing and based on location and community and culture, I believe there are some fundamental beliefs that should be present in our faith, and that is the extravagant welcome of all of God's children and the hope and commitment to human flourishing for all. I hear you, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit said, Amen. As the Pentecost text says, God's spirit will be poured out on some flesh. Is that what it said? No, it said all flesh. Not excluded because of race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, age, ability, academic accomplishment, or financial status. We serve the God of all creation and all flesh. All humans should be able to worship and live free lives, able to flourish. And sometimes that flourishing means studying and understanding the history that we don't relive that pain, the pain of the past so that we can move forward. 
As Ms. Gorman says, that our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. But if we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthrights. And these words were restricted. But here, High Park Union, we're on the right track. And there is a greater inclusiveness for the beloved community towards which we should strive. And that is an inclusiveness that is willing to speak up and rein in other Christians when they get things wrong. Help me, Holy Ghost. Pentecost Sunday is about fire. Fire spreads. I didn't even put that in there. The spirit just got fire spreads. The spirit came like tongues of fire landing on each person in the room who then began to prophesy, that is, speak truth. And, and I want to tie that with another fire for the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29, that even when he had made up his mind, nope, I'm not going to say another word about God or that God puts in me. Jeremiah said, there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary with holding it in. I cannot. That's how I feel when I hear about the banning of books and poetry and history. There's a fire shut up in my bones. I cannot hold it in. Do you ever feel that fire about anything? Does hearing about the banning, or excuse me, the restricted access, let's make sure we use the language they're using, of Amanda's poem, or restricted access to the love of Langston? A book about, a book of Langston Hughes poems or books on black history by a Christian and all she had to do was write a few words on a form? You should see this form. She literally checked a couple of boxes and wrote something like it's critical race theory and it's hatred language. And boom, bam. My prayer is that produces a fire shut up in our bones and it won't leave us alone. We're weary, as Jeremiah said, of holding it in. See, the even more inclusive beloved community, I believe, first has to include those who already consider themselves Christians but are getting it so wrong, yet there seems to be no outcry. Not just towards this one woman, but towards a full movement that seeks to erase the truth of history. No outcry. That same movement is seeking leadership again in our country, which is the essence, in essence means influence across the world. And no outcry. There is an even more inclusive beloved community, and it begins with our calling out of our own. There's actually a few places in scripture where you'll find that kind of calling out, like in Numbers 11, as Georgia read this morning, which describes an Old Testament scene, much like the day of Pentecost. It says that the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to Moses and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not do it again. Two men remained in the camp, it says, Eldad and the other Medad, and the spirit rested on them. So they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran to Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, one of Moses' chosen, said, my Lord, Moses, stop them. But Moses said, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And while these men were a bit misguided in their zeal to have Moses stop them, it's their willingness to say, my Lord, stop them, that I applaud. Then them seem like I should support that since Moses smacked them on the hand, but he didn't smack them on the hand for crying out. He smacked them on the hand for their intentions, their misguidedness. And I'm suggesting that more of us need to say, my Lord, stop them. See, the mother in Miami had a my Lord stop them in her spirit. 
But where is the my Lord stop them in our spirit? Where is the fire shut up in our bones for the followers of Christ who see things go awry? I'm not just talking about you, High Park Union. You are one, one millionth of the Christian society. I'm talking about all of us. Where's the fire who sees things go awry but have been regulated to spectators and are just happy to come to church each Sunday? Where's the fire? So there is a more inclusive community, and it includes those who already consider themselves Christians. See, our faith, Christianity, is not a segmented kind of faith. Christians are not supposed to be so very different in our morals and beliefs as far as the East is from the West. Jesus was one. On the day of Pentecost, there was one Holy Spirit. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit, he says, we were all baptized into one body, and we were all made to drink one Spirit. Some of, it, some of us know it this way, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. I'm adding one Holy Spirit. We ought to be unified, particularly when it comes to human rights, freedom, and flourishing. But we are not. And so on this day of Pentecost, while we have a great mission statement and a welcome, which is our call to worship most Sundays, there is a greater inclusiveness, a greater call to the beloved community and to strive towards the very words of our mission and our welcome. I want to suggest to you today that we need to do more to stand up and speak out when the beloved community is we need to believe so much in our faith's vision of unity and community that when it is being threatened, we will care so much that we speak up and say, my Lord, stop them. Because Dr. King said it this way, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. You see, I'm such, I'm sure church was never meant to be so individual, so inwardly focused, so insular. Again, not a critique of High Park Union, but the institution of church. I want to be careful of giving the impression that if we get it right in here with our mission and our welcome, that we should pat ourselves on the back feeling we've accomplished what God has called us to do. Getting it right in here is for the sole purpose of influencing the greater community and society, might I say, out there. Just as our friend who complimented our call to worship said, people inside get this. He said, you all need to say this out there. He's right, and he's right in line with our mission, for there is a line, and you might have picked it up when you read it, that says, Pursuing God's justice in the world. We said that. With the promise of love, liberation, and joy. And if we never ever connect or share or interact or participate or speak or talk or share or go out there, we're missing the full opportunity to fulfill not only our mission, but to do our part of the Great Commission to spread the good news throughout the world, also in our call to worship today. I'm simply suggesting that we live what we say. So where is our holy anger when Floridians are banning black history? I recently saw the celebration of a baptism of 500 people in the lake, the ocean maybe, in Florida, in a city in Florida. One big gathering, 500 people baptized. And they celebrated their new faith in Jesus Christ. 
And I wondered if just one of the 500 was appalled by the banning in Florida. Just one. When we sense that Christians are getting it wrong, we should speak up. And I know that's a judgment call, right and wrong. We have to be careful of that. But like the men went to Moses and said, stop them. They took a chance because in their hearts, there was so much at stake. And while I focus mostly on the banning of books and history by Christians in Florida, we really don't have to go that far. Some of us have people right around us who are Christians who don't believe in the beloved community. They have disdain for diversity. They're afraid of losing privilege or their stuff, and that fear has turned to hatred. We have people who are immigrants in our city right now who need help. They need basics, food, water, shelter, clothing, and there are Christians who know nothing about the hospitality to the stranger, which is core to our faith. And they have protested giving help to fellow human beings. When you encounter that fear in fellow Christians, remember the beloved community, remember the mission and the welcome that we are so proud of and ask God how you shall respond. You see, the power and the beauty of Pentecost is that the Holy Spirit gives power and it fell on each one of them. We just heard anointing fall on me, give me the, the unction and the boldness, open my mouth, one psalm says, and I will fill it. If you don't know what to say, ask God how to respond. The power and the beauty of the Holy Spirit is that it gives you the power to overcome what seems to be a natural tendency toward sameness that we need to protect what's ours and protect our stuff. I'm sure that the Holy Spirit gives power to overcome old mindsets like, well, they need to fend for themselves and pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. I am sure that the Holy Spirit gives power to overcome one's propensity to be selfish or propensity to be self preserving. I'm sure the Holy Spirit gives power to open up and be compassionate. Loving and kind, it used to be taught to children like this, do unto others, help me out. Simple. I'm also sure that the Holy Spirit gives power to speak truth to power. When laws are being written that oppose freedom. And the Holy Spirit gives power such that when we see injustice that threatens or goes counter to what we know God seeks to establish, it calls us to act. How do I know? I hear you. How do you know that the Holy Spirit gives us power to act against oppression where Jesus said this one day, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Y'all, does that sound familiar? Anybody know what he says after that? He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Put the pieces together. To proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind. Some of us have blind around us. We need to help recover their sight to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And those of us who believe in Jesus, who believe in the Holy Spirit, and who have received that power, should not only be celebrating this text in here, celebrating Jesus in here, but we should be proclaiming the good news to the poor out there, recovery of sight to the blind out there, proclaiming the freedom of prisoners out there working to set the oppressed free. 
We should be working towards the beloved community, not only in here. And believe me, I'm so grateful. You would not believe the visitors who come, who say, I love the diversity of your church, and so do I. It is a blessing for us to experience the amazing diversity that Hyde Park Union continues to draw in here. If we're not careful, this text that we hold up often, see, it's, it got wor it's, it's got words like poor, freedom, oppressed. If they knew it was in there, they might try to ban it. But I'm pretty clear, it's likely they aren't reading that text. If we're not careful, other places around our country will begin to follow Florida if they haven't already. The only thing that might save us is if we speak up, speak out, understand that that is our call as Christians especially on this day of Pentecost where the anointing fell and on all and it blessed all. Speak up and act for there is an indeed a more inclusive community and it starts with our fellow Christians who are getting it wrong.